that he was rude to the women. Got some breaking news to report to you regarding the Idaho case. New search warrants revealing dozens of major companies are being forced to turn over information in connection with Brian Koberger. The unsealed search warrants from Pennsylvania show that items were taken from the white Elantra and Koberger's residence. Brian Koberger was fired as a teaching assistant from Washington State University. I am not going to share the physical document in this video. He had pictures of one of the female victims on his phone. Brian Koberger followed both cases. Kaylee and Maddie on Instagram, but Koberger liked every one of Maddie's photos. Have you ever wondered how you would react if you were accused of a brutal crime that you didn't commit? What would you say? How would you act? Well, picture this. It's about 7 a.m. on a freezing winter morning. Usually you'd be in bed hitting the snooze button on your phone, wishing you could stay under the warm covers for another two hours, forgetting about the rest of the world, but not today. Because in this moment, you're nowhere near your bed. In fact, you're in the coldest, most sterile and unwelcoming place you've ever found yourself, a police interrogation room. So here you are, sitting on a cold, hard metal chair, the stench of day-old coffee fills the air, and you feel the warmth of a hand rest on your shoulder. When you look up, you see that hand belongs to your mom, but she's not smiling down on you in joy. In fact, she's not looking at you at all. She's looking ahead at someone else in the room and she looks terrified. And that hand on your shoulder is shaking. Confused, you follow your mom's eyeline over until you see who she's looking at, a detective. In fact, several detectives. But they're not looking back at your mom, not at all. In fact, their eyes are fixed solely on you. Eventually you notice that their mouths are moving, almost in slow motion, but you can't quite make out what they're saying. It's all a blur and haze and none of this seems real and you think you must be dreaming, still under the warm blankets in your bed, your safe place. But as your shock slowly starts to fade and the voices come more and more into focus, you realize what they're saying. Did you see the killer? Do you know who the killer is? Did you have anything to do with this? And it's in that moment you realize that you just survived a brutal attack and the world thinks that maybe you were in on it. And this is what we know. Hey you, welcome back. We are diving straight into part three of our deep dive into the ongoing Moscow, Idaho case about the tragic loss of four beautiful, innocent college students who were taken from their friends and families in the worst way. Xana Kernodal, Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, and Ethan Chapin. Now I've said it before in part one and two, but I really do think anytime we cover these types of cases, it's important to try and keep the victims and survivors front of mind, especially while talking about the alleged culprit as this is such a tremendously heartbreaking situation for so many. Now, in part one, we covered what we know about the timeline, the affidavit, the items recovered from his home. And in part two, we dissected a ton of social media posts on Facebook and Reddit, believed to be made by Brian Koberger. And I took us into a look inside the mind of Brian and pointed out a number of alarming warning signs that I think were screaming out when he was just 15 years old. So if you haven't seen my analysis in part one or part two, I highly recommend it for further context of this case. They're both going to be linked below. Now, there have been many new developments with this case and tons of you requested an update. So here we are. And just like before, I have combed through endless documents and resources to try and present this as clearly as possible as there are so, so many conspiracies theories and rumors just kind of dashed all over the internet. So hopefully this will help you make sense of what's currently going on, okay? You know, you can always trust a bitch has done her homework. And with that, if and when I talk about things that are just theories, I will present them as such. And we are getting closer to the preliminary hearing coming up in June where we should learn more about the prosecution's case and also a possible defense for Brian Koberger. So things are really ramping up now. But as 
it stands, over 70 warrants have been revealed and there have been so many conspiracy theories and some just like straight up like lies being told. And honestly, okay, I see it, I have seen it, we're gonna talk about it. But first, hi, my name is Swoop, welcome. I'm a documentary filmmaker and am obsessed with stories and cases that challenge what I thought I knew about them. So if you're into mind-bending deep dives that tell stories from a fresh new perspective, you've come to the right place. If that sounds good to you, please go ahead and tickle the like button, you know, right under the chin and also hit the subscribe button and turn on all notifications so you don't miss a single deep dive. And of course, if you'd like to join the Petty Universe University community. Also, welcome, come one, come all. And if you want to grab any of the official Petty University apparel, the link for that is always listed below as well. Now, just a reminder, as always, everything that we cover is alleged. These are opinions based on the research. Please do share your thoughts in the comments. Don't spread any hate and let's keep a healthy conversation going. And if you have any information regarding this case, please contact the FBI tip line immediately. Now, this video is sponsored and I will be donating a portion of the sponsor proceeds to Hope for Justice in support of victims. As you all know, your support and the sponsors are the reason I am able to even make these docs as well as the donations. And I only partner with brands that I use and believe will bring value to your life. So thank you for watching and checking out the sponsor each week, which encourages them to come back so that we can continue to do more of these. It really does mean so much. So real quick, and then we'll jump into the disturbing update in this case. So I don't know about you, but I never thought that quality restful sleep was even possible. Like I thought that everyone who said they slept well were literally just lying to my face because my whole life I have slept like absolute garbage. I'd lie awake forever. I'd wake up 20 times. Ever since I got my Helix sleep mattress, I'm legitimately getting the best sleep that I have ever had. Oh my gosh, I'm never leaving this bed ever. This is so st like stupid comfortable. Is this what it's like? To sleep on a good mattress. The Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently ship right to your front door. Now everybody is different and Helix knows that. So they made a sleep quiz to match your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress just for you. And if you sleep with a partner, you can even take the sleep quiz together to find the perfect match for both of you. So I took the quiz and based on my results, Helix matched me with their Midnight Luxe mattress. I personally I personally am a back and side sleeper and used to think that I needed like a super soft squishy mattress because of my fibromyalgia and my spinal injuries. I was so wrong. Like I got a medium firm mattress with lumbar support and it has made a huge improvement on how my neck and my back feel in the morning. You know, honestly, I'm the type of person to consider even one minute of like slightly less intense pain a blessing. And this mattress has made the first part of my day so much more bearable. Now, I also got the Glacio Tex cooling cover upgrade, which helps regulate my temperature. And honestly, the best part with your Helix Sleep mattress, you get a hundred night sleep trial so you can try it. For over three months, you get a 10 year warranty. So if you're on the search for better quality sleep in an amazing mattress, this is your sign, honey. Click the link below or go to helixsleep.com swoop to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Give it a hundred days and treat your yourself to the sleep you deserve, honey. Okay, back to the doc. Now, before starting, I again want to extend my deepest condolences to the families and friends of the four who are at the center of all of this, Maddie, Kaylee, Zanna, and Ethan. As we're all aware, they were real people with promising futures that deserved a chance at life, but their lives were sadly stolen from them and their families in just the worst way imaginable, just far too soon. There are no words to ever express enough empathy and compassion for what their families are coping with. And I do hope that in time, their families can find some fraction of healing and that their memories will always be a blessing. Let's dive in. What are, you know, obviously, when, uh, Lindsay, there's multiple uh, indicators or motivators of why people do what. 
so while we still haven't heard the actual 911 call and we likely won't until the gag order has been lifted, which could be a while, who knows? I mean, we could possibly have to wait until the trial if there is one, but we did finally learn who made the 911 call and it wasn't either of the surviving roommates. It was actually Ethan Chapin's best friend. Now, they have not been named, but if you've kind of been following along, I think there's a good chance that you know who it is from the memorial service, but it wasn't from Ethan's friend's phone either. It was from the phone of the surviving roommate who saw the bushy eyebrowed masked man in the house. Her name is DM. I know her name is out there. It's very public. I still feel kind of uncomfortable just using her name. So I'm going to continue to refer to her by her initials. But this is where it gets murky, confusing, and questionable for a lot of people. So we have heard about the frozen shock phase that, that DM experienced according to the police affidavit, but there are reports that potentially contradict this. So Ethan's sister-in-law actually posted on Reddit stating that, quote, yes, I hope it will come out to what D heard. D supposedly called all the girls in the house after the crying and screaming stopped and no one answered and she still didn't call the police. She needs to explain herself and her actions that night. So that is not what the police report says at all, but the police report, the affidavit does say that DM did hear crying and screaming. I think there are maybe only likely two scenarios here. One is that she was in a frozen shock and she did know something was very wrong and could not act or just kind of shut down. You know what I mean? And there are plenty of science to back that that can happen to people. It can be the fight, flight, or you freeze kind of thing. Or a second possible scenario is that she did call the roommates not thinking there were four brutal slayings happening, but rather, you know, partying or drinking or college kids, you know, just being loud. The problem with that scenario, as Ethan's sister-in-law points out, is that if DM was calling to roommates to check on them and no one answers, not really going to be perceived as checking on them, right? I mean, that would kind of be like step one. And then when no one answered, one might think to go physically to check on them. So it's kind of some shit. There's a lot of conflicting stuff going on here. And just, you know, when I think about screams, especially, and again, there's a couple of things, like if you were to put yourself in the scenario, if you hear screaming happening, I don't think that the natural instinct is to think bloody murder is happening. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't think that's where the brain naturally goes. So I don't, you know, want to hold it over DM for like not making that assumption right away. But at the same time, when I think about like screams, like playful screams or just pure, actual fighting for your life terror screams, those are gonna sound quite different. And I feel like for most people, it's gonna have a pretty significantly different impact on you as the person hearing it, right? Like I can remember, this was a long, long time ago. I was at my mom's house and I was sleeping down the hall and I had the door closed and she was in her bedroom asleep. And I woke up to the most most just like terrifying screams that I have ever heard in my life. I still to this day hear that sound and I know exactly what that sound was and it was coming from my mom. And so I literally without thinking, I just threw my covers off, opened and ran down the hall and went straight into her room. I mean, I didn't even think about anything at all. I just, all I knew is my mom is screaming in a way that I have never heard a person scream before. And I charged into that room and I was screaming back and I was like, mom, I'm coming, I'm coming. And it was terrifying. And when I get into the room, she was having like a lucid dreaming night terror. And she had envisioned, she told me what she saw. I'm not even gonna repeat it, it's horrifying. Her brain was like half awake, half asleep. So she thought what she was seeing was absolutely real. And what she described 
was absolutely, that is the type of scream that would come out of you if that's what you really thought you were seeing. And so that scream, I would never confuse that with roughhousing or playing around or, you know, college partying, whatever. I just wouldn't. So it's an interesting conversation, right? I don't know that we're ever really going to know what happened or what was going on with Dia. Maybe if it goes to trial and she testifies, but that might not ever happen. It's tough and I can imagine that this is going to be something that unfortunately is probably going to sit with and maybe haunt the victim's families for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's a difficult thing to think there was someone who heard something and they didn't call 911 for whatever reason. And I'm not trying to fault DM. She is a survivor of this. It is not her fault at all. So it's just a, a heartbreaking situation. And, you know, with the reports that Xana had many defensive wounds and was, you know, grabbing the, the weapon, I'm not gonna say the word, and had very deep injuries on her fingers, she may have just seen her boyfriend, Ethan, ended, right? I don't think that Xana was silent through that. I think there is a chance that she witnessed what happened to her boyfriend and than is fighting literally for her life. So I think that those screams, those cries would have been quite a very distinctive type of sound. It's so awful. Like I still can't actually bring myself anywhere close to the reality of this horror because every time I do like, you know, think, you know, they were just there in their house, their safe place after, you know, having a late night and talking with their best friend, maybe in bed or just getting some food and, I just, my brain just can't go there. And probably most of, we can't, you, you, you can't imagine what that's like unless you're in that position, God forbid. And honestly, the frozen shock is not off the table in my book because it, it just seems likely if you really think about it, but it's also hard to justify that if DM called all the roommates and then didn't check on them and just went to sleep, then why did it happen that way? Now, I know that the coroner has said that calling 911 sooner would not have saved anyone's life that night as the wounds were just too much, but the police were very close to the King Road house. I mean, this is a police station that's like 0.08 miles away. And if someone had been able to call 911 at the first sound of something wrong, maybe, just maybe, they could have gotten there in time to save Xana and maybe even Ethan uh, because they were the last attacked. Or to catch the perpetrator, to catch him in the act or there. You know, it's estimated all of this took about 15 minutes and the cops could easily have been there in probably three to five minutes or less uh, because of how close it was. Ethan's sister-in-law also posted that the 911 caller was the friend who went in because D called him to come over because she was scared from what she had heard in the night. He went to Xana and Ethan's room first and then called 911. Why D or B, the other roommate, didn't call the police once is the question. And again, I just, it really just breaks my heart knowing that these families, this is something that they will grapple with for a long time, if not forever. And again, no matter what the coroner says, it's one thing to hear that, but it's another thing to actually believe that. But again, like with the sister-in-law, we have to remember that this is hearsay and we can't calculate all of the emotions that are going on. It is a lot. And we don't have any actual proof yet of DM calling the roommates or Ethan's friend or anybody else. So in one of those scenarios, like if DM calls the roommates and then calls Ethan's friends and the police affidavit is incorrect or at least leaving out a lot of details or two, and we have heard this theory as well. Ethan's friend came over because that was the nature of their friendship. You know, either he just comes over because it's, you know, Sunday late morning to see what's happening or he called and get, couldn't get through. And so he just shows up, discovers what has happened and calls 911 from DM's phone. I don't know why it wasn't his phone. You know, the issue here is that the official police affidavit says that DM was in a frozen shock phase and makes no mention of making phone calls. So if all of this ends up in court, then these phone calls all of a sudden become a problem or can be proving that she was in a frozen shock phase. If she was frozen in fear, how is she making calls? 
these are the things that the defense is going to bring up, right? And that can be terrible for the prosecution. It would essentially make her testimony in some ways, at least according to the defense, worthless. Or even worse, it would provide some instance of reasonable doubt for Brian. Now, hopefully there's enough evidence against Brian, if he is guilty, allegedly, to where none of the these particular details about DM and the 91, none of that will matter because there's just enough evidence to convict anyways, you know? Now, there is something else that we're gonna talk about in a bit that relates to all of the stuff I just mentioned, and that is a, you know, a self-proclaimed friend of DM, a person who claims they are connected to DM's inner circle and has a lot to say about all of this that negates pretty much the entire entire affidavit and we're gonna get into that in a little bit because I have thoughts my petty might come out for a moment because sometimes people just really be getting on my damn nerves with stuff that it feels like they're trying to do with this case but anyways I digress Maddie's on the right her best friend Kaylee's on the left Koberger had liked all of Maddie's photos compared to liking just a couple of the ones so even though there is a gag order in place, another wildly suspicious thing we've learned is that Brian had more than one photo of at least one of the female victims on his phone in his photo roll. Now, obviously Brian's phone was one of the things that they confiscated when they arrested him. And of course they're gonna look at the photos on his phone to see if there are any links. And apparently there are quite a few. So we don't know which female female victim the photos are of even though a lot of us have suspicions of who it is and we d initially don't like we don't really know if they were pictures Brian took himself possibly while stalking them or if they were screenshots of pictures that they had posted online on Instagram or something now there have been some recent updates that it's been speculated that they were pictures that Brian actually downloaded from Instagram but again I have to speak in like just generalities here because there's been no official statement about that. It's all of these like a source has said and like, oh, I don't know who's confirming the sources. I never entirely know sometimes. So I'm treading lightly with that detail. But now, of course, Miss Ashley Banfield has reported on this. I'm not going to lie. There have been a couple of times where Ashley Banfield's reporting has been a little like, uh... So again, I'm just trying to be very careful, especially with a case that is so new. But the story was actually broken by People Magazine, which has had somewhat surprising good reporting in the past. <laughs> like I just, sometimes People Magazine be catching me off guard because normally I'm like, eh. But now I'm like, oh, okay, people. I'm listening. Now, uh, Steve Helling, the journalist that broke this story, was interviewed on News Nation and explained how they were getting some of this information. Well, before the second gag order came along, you know, we were getting, you know, you were getting it, I was getting it, we were getting these tips. And, you know, I think that they had a pretty good idea, even back then, a month ago, of who the primary target was. Whether or not these pictures are of that person, who you and I both pretty much no, is, is, remains to be seen. So who are they talking about? Well, we're pretty sure it wasn't Xana and Maddie and Kaylee were together in Maddie's room. Now we also know the horrific fact that Kaylee suffered many more injuries than anyone. And I know that's difficult to talk about as all four of them are no longer here, but Kaylee's dad, Steven, has spoken out before the gag order about this. And he does go into some pretty hefty detail that I'm not gonna repeat here, but he he did say that while his daughter was in bed with Mogan in their off-campus home when they were both killed their injuries were not even close to matching. Their points of damage don't match. So Stephen certainly thinks that his daughter was the main target and the injuries might support that. Now there could be another argument made where if this was Brian allegedly that she was the first person that he attacked and therefore he would have had more energy going after the first person and would have been slowly being drained of energy because it is a very 
physical thing that happened, so that is also a potential. But the Gonzalez family are the only one of the victim's families that are challenging the court's gag order, which is interesting. Attorney representing Kaylee Gonzalez's family filed a motion that says they are not parties in the case against accused killer Brian Koberger and should not be subject to the judge's non-dissemination order. However, there have been other reports that point to Maddie like this. Sources close to the investigation telling us that the person who is uh, featured on Brian Koberger's phone, the female victim who is featured on Brian Koberger's phone, is the same person that he was reaching out to on social media. Uh, and also that the photos were not taken by Brian Koberger, they were downloaded off of that victim's Instagram. So he had taken the pictures from that victim's Instagram. And then I also have this uh, reporting that Brian Koberger followed both Kaylee and Maddie on Instagram, but Koberger liked every one of Maddie's photos. Maddie's on the right, her best friend Kaylee's on the left. Koberger had liked all of Maddie's photos compared to liking just a couple of the ones um, on Kaylee's account. He followed both, but he liked all of Maddie's and compared to liking just a couple of them on um, Kaylee's account. So, I mean, it, that's huge, right? Like, if this is true, although, you know, I'm getting a little sick of the whole sources close to the investigation and that Ashley Banfield is often then the source that other news outlets use as their source. I get it, but it's a little, you know. But if that is true, that's very damning. Or at least telling that Maddie was indeed the target and there, maybe Kaylee sustaining more injuries could have been out of jealousy that she was so close to Maddie, you know? There's a lot of like potential theories that could go on here. And there is some other information that supports potentially Maddie being the main target, like the Mad Greek where Maddie and Xana worked and supposedly Brian had visited to get a specific vegan pizza. So you tell me, like, what do y'all think? Let me know in the comments. So I do think that one of them was targeted, but which one? And all of this is hinging on these reports being true and we just don't know and I can't rely fully on this until they've been corroborated by a more provable source than, you know, Banfield's sources close to the investigation. I Hopefully she has thoroughly vetted them and it's accurate information, but we're kind of getting it in like a now hearsay format, you know, so we got to be careful. It becomes a fascination. It becomes an obsession. It becomes your identity. Uh, that sort of obsession and compulsion and you overlay it with not having any feelings. We need to talk about the moment Brian was arrested. Some extremely interesting information that has come out and this is confirmed from the uh, warrant for his arrest and also straight from the mouth of the first assistant district attorney in Monroe County, Michael Mancuso. And that is that when they arrested Brian, he was in the kitchen of his parents' house wearing latex gloves, separating his trash from the kitchen trash can and putting it in Ziploc bags. I am not joking, Brian, what the f you doing, Brian? I don't like Brian, okay? Uh, but this is this is a legit fact. The assistant DA said that when authorities entered Koberger's parents' home around 1.30 a.m. to arrest him, they found him in the kitchen wearing latex gloves and placing trash in Ziploc bags. And assistant DA Mancuso gets even more detailed. Mr. Koberger was found awake in the kitchen area, dressed in shorts and a shirt, wearing latex medical type gloves and apparently was taking his personal trash and putting it into a separate Ziploc baggies. So like, he guilty y'all. I mean, allegedly, I'm just innocent until proven otherwise, but you know, we have to wait for the justice system. And I actually don't even know if this kind of thing is even that big of a piece of evidence in court, but in the courthouse in my brain, this shit is screaming, okay, gavel going down, he guilty, okay? Just Brian away with you, allegedly. Like, sorry, petty is my love language. It's also my coping mechanism for really heinous shit. 
minutes. But like the only thing, the only thing I can think that could possibly explain this Ziploc baggy trash can thing away would be, you know, if the defense claims that Brian has an extreme OCD or misophobia, but, and this is a big ass but, they would then have to prove that he had a history of doing this, you know, in a history that lasted, predates the events of what happened. Because what it looks like is that Brian is trying to hide his DNA and his little fingery fingerprints. And we know that the police have a piece of DNA from the knife sheath, and we know that they've matched it to the son of Brian's dad. Think about that. Who is the son of Brian's dad? That would be Brian. It almost looks like Brian is aware that that the police are closing in on him and he's just doing everything he can think of, being, you know, a doctoral student of criminology after all, to throw off the case. But it's too late, Brian. You already left too much evidence to get away with it, hopefully. You'd have to have more information, like a tag number, obviously, or something really unique about the car. And you'd have to say, it's wanted in a possible homicide in, in Moscow, Idaho. All right, another huge thing that happened recently is the search warrants for Brian Koberger's person, uh, the Koberger family home in Pennsylvania, and Brian's white Hyundai Elantra were unsealed, so we now know what was seized from each of those things, meaning what Brian had on him and was wearing when he was arrested, uh, what they took from the Koberger parents' house, and what they took from his car. Now remember, they already unsealed the search warrant for Brian's apartment in Pullman, in Washington where he was living when the crime was committed. And we went over all of the stuff that they seized from there in the first doc we did on this case. And that's where they recovered, you know, a bunch of hair strands and animal hair, computer tower, and multiple pieces of bedding, sheets, pillows with red stains, among other things like receipts and a nitrile glove. Well, let's look at the new search warrants and see what we've got. Okay, so for the first one for Brian, himself. It says that they're looking for him in a single family residence with white siding, tan foundation, and dark colored shutters, a small shed with a door, and windows located at the back of the property. Yep, everything looks in order here, and it was signed off by a judge and the DA. Okay, okay. And here are the list of items found on Brian's person, meaning on him, on his body, and the clothes he was wearing, and what was in his pocket. So there was one silver flashlight, four medical style gloves, a white Arizona Jean Company large t-shirt, a champion WSU Cougars large black sweatshirt, a pair of black and white size 13 Nike shoes, which is gonna be really interesting to see if they can match that shoe print or that shoe size to the shoe print that was found at the scene, a pair of Under Armour socks, a pair of Under Armour black shorts, Under Armour black boxers, large, and one buckle swap, which is like a cheek swab. First things first. So obviously, Brian's got a thing for some Under Armour. I mean, talk about brand loyalty here. But the flashlight is interesting. Now, maybe he had it in his pocket so that he could go see where to place his Ziploc baggies of trash. We know he was scattering trash in the neighbor's bins because who the f does that, Brian? Uh, so maybe he needed a light to do it because, you know, you gotta do that at night, right? That's what a regular ass person taking out their trash is gonna do is in the middle of the night with a flashlight. Not, you know, during the day in the morning like everybody else. No, no, Brian is special. Sorry, I'd get, I just you, Brian. Okay, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to remain completely unbiased, but also y'all know if I am feeling some bias, I'm gonna be honest about it. The only other thing here besides his big 13 size feet is the buckle, yes, buckle swab. That would be, you know, again, the inside of the cheek and that would be for DNA to compare to the DNA they've already found. And, and remember, they've already tied DNA to the son of his dad, AKA 
him. So it's already tied to him from the knife sheath, but this is just kind of due diligence getting even more direct DNA evidence, which we like to see that. Now, they also obtained uh, warrants to search the Koberger family house as well as that white Hyundai Elantra that they believed was parked in the garage of the Koberger house. Oh, and we got a VIN number on that Elantra in case you thought we didn't know the exact mother and Hyundai we were looking for. Here's what they got from that search. So they got swabs, Ziploc bag with pink zipper, seven quarters, plastic bag with green zipper, 36 dimes, 32 nickels, and eight pennies. So, you know, he's got the classic, like, you know, change in the car that you did in like 2015, which is like, I kind of remember the last time I've touched like coins of change. All these parking meters in Los Angeles are like, you know, swipe your car because we could be charging way more than you're gonna have quarters for. But anyways, this was all apparently in Brian's car. So what else? There were gloves, receipts, car insurance, registration, hiking boots, comfort in room key holder and stay information, uh, tire iron and shovel. There were also goggles, floor mats, reflective vests, used water bottles, wrench, door panels, seats and seat cushions, headdress, seat belt, visor. Hold up, okay, they just took the door panel and the seats and the seat belts. Why did they just take the whole car? Phone charger, band-aid, wrappers, maps, documents, and a seat belt boot. Whew. So what we're hoping with the evidence in the car is that, you know, if he allegedly did it and that car was his transportation, then when he got into the car that he brought some evidence from the scene in with him, maybe some hair or skin, nails, fibers from the house, from the victims, from the dog, anything that could have been transferred to any single part of his car. If there is any of them in his car, that's going to be a huge high the bow, wrap it up, fork skewer, roasted done, bitch, right? Now let's see what the FBI got from the house itself. So we're gonna go with some highlights here because they took a lot of stuff, which again, we love to see it, but a knife, a Smith & Wesson pocket knife, a Glock 22 with three empty magazines, a cell phone, several computers, two containers of a green leafy substance, AKA let's just say it, the devil's lettuce, okay? There were also black face masks, a black hat, and several articles of dark colored clothing actually a ton of clothing, computers, hard drives, cell phones, books, a criminology textbook, prescriptions, notes, a lot of stuff. And finally, a book with underlining on page 118. Now just remember that for later, we're gonna go deep into a wild theory on that particular item in a minute. I mean, let's face it, you could barely read this writing, bless the heart of whoever wrote this stuff, but they felt pretty confident that they should document that it had underlining on page 118. And that's essentially what the FBI took into evidence. And it will be interesting to see if and when this goes to trial to see how many pieces of evidence the prosecution ends up admitting. Because we know that they had a lot already, but we've also learned about the over 40 companies that were also served warrants to obtain information on the victims, Ethan, Zana, Maddie, and Kaylee, as as well as the suspect, Brian Koberger. And now we are learning a few things were happening in that man's life, leading up to and right after the murders. Things like being investigated. Now, as law enforcement was investigating the case, we now know that over 70 search warrants had been served to over 40 companies, mostly pertaining to obtaining records that may be related to the case. And we know Brian's phone records were subpoenaed, but now we know that many other companies that law enforcement is obtaining records from. Now, these warrants don't tell us what law enforcement found, so we don't know exactly what they were looking for per se. And these also span a few months, but but from right after the horrific night uh, when they were just starting out their search up through January when they already had a probable cause and arrested Brian in his parents' house while he was wearing latex gloves, separating his personal trash from the family trash into Ziploc bags. Yeah, Brian, got you. So this would be just, you know, gathering even more evidence and kind of triangulating evidence to build on the prosecution's case, as they say. So while we don't know exactly everything, 
everything that's in these. We do know some, and we can also take some pretty good guesses just based on the company's names themselves. So let's just take a look at some of them. Okay, so right here we've got several warrants served to phone companies uh, and also internet companies, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Inland Cellular. Uh, some of these were super early in the investigation to begin narrowing the search by seeing what customers' cell phones had pinged off of you know, the nearby cell towers the night of the crime. And there were more sent to AT&T after they had identified Brian. These are the phone records for the innocent victims, Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and Ethan. And also the phone records for troglodyte tat Brian, who allegedly took them from the world, allegedly. Now there's DoorDash, which the police looked at after all of the orders, uh, you know, delivered to the King Road house. But also, of course, importantly, that last order that Xana had made that showed up at 4 a.m. right before all of this happened. And it could also be to see if Brian had previously ordered anything uh, from Mad Greek, where Maddie and Xana had worked, uh, that we went over in my last doc about this case. Now there is a conspiracy theory out there that thinks that Brian was the DoorDash delivery person that night or that Brian had ordered the delivery that night. But from what the police have said, that just doesn't seem to be true. They already interviewed and cleared the DoorDash delivery person from that 4 a.m. delivery and it wasn't Brian and Xana did order the food. Now, the investigation also went to look at the financial transaction of the victims while they were still, you know, narrowing in on suspects. So there are warrants for bank accounts and credit card records from Bank of America, Umpqua Bank, PayPal, Venmo, and the parent company of Square. You know, like that credit card reader that small businesses um, can use on their cell phones. They also requested surveillance footage from the Umpqua Bank branch. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That was close to where Maddie and Kate Lee had been hanging out that night. Then later they obtained more records from more financial institutions like Wells Fargo, American Express, Discover, Washington's Banner Bank, and three different credit unions. And this may have been after they had identified Brian and were looking at his finances, or it could have been more of the victim stuff or of course a combination, but the financial stuff didn't happen just like all at once. Uh, there were initial warrants and then follow-up warrants, assuming they found more information that led them to request these records. Now, what else? Okay, so we've got uh, computer and social media stuff. Apple, uh, they got the victim's iCloud information and history. Uh, Snapchat, you know, they got data on all their accounts from August 1st up through that horrible night. Uh, Meta, this is a big one. As you know, Meta is the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, so there's potentially a lot here. Uh, we have the reports and suspicion that Brian was following at least one of the victims on Instagram and that he had even messaged one or more of them and that he had liked like all of the photos. So I'm sure part of this warrant is looking at all of the Instagram accounts to see messages and who's following who. Uh, remember any links that prosecutors can find between Brian and Maddie, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan are huge because they're all going to help prove the case that there was the connection there and then help them to better develop and establish motive. Anything that can prove motive really. So if he's messaging them and they're not responding or opening the messages, there's another piece of evidence to add to the pile and the bigger that pile, the better the case. We want a massive steaming storm pile of poo on top of his head if he did it allegedly. Speaking of piles, uh, Facebook would also be included in this. Now, this would be quite interesting. If you saw my last doc, part two, there was this Facebook account under the name Papa Roger, and it was hugely involved in discussing the case after it had happened. Whoever was running that account 
was talking a whole lot uh, with a lot of evidence and things that they knew before the public even knew it. They were sharing there, like where Ethan may have been found and that there was a sheath left behind. And they also tried to sh throw some evidence out, like the white car is a red herring. Remember that quote? Don't look at that one. I don't know who would have motive to be like, don't look at the white Hyundai Elantra. I mean, you know, that it's a red herring. It ain't nothing. Yeah, way to go, Brian. I kind of think that it's him who was posting on Papa Roger, but hopefully we'll find out. So the warrant to Meta hopefully covers this Facebook account or any accounts that Brian had and can get a ton of information about him from this. And also anything from Xana, Ethan, Maddie, and Kaylee's accounts to see if there was any communication or attempts at communication there. This of course would be a huge piece of evidence if the Papa Roger thing was proven to be true and to be Brian's. Uh, so again, you can go watch the part two if you haven't seen it. We do a whole thing on this that I found incredibly eerie and it really convinced me that Papa Roger is most likely Brian. But see for yourself and we will hopefully find a concrete answer if and when this goes to trial. Now there were warrants for places that sold K-Bar knives, hardware stores and other local retailers that sold the knives and sheaths. A lot, a lot of warrants came out November through January. So let's see, oh, also Amazon. Warrants to Amazon about the K-Bar knife sales and then also Walmart and eBay for the same info. And then later a follow-up search warrant to eBay shows us that police had particular interest in 13 user accounts in nine US states and one in Japan related to K-Bar, of which two were in Washington state where Brian was living and was getting fired from his TA position at Washington State University. One in Idaho and one in Pennsylvania where the Koberger family home is and where he was of course eventually arrested. The date, oh, the dating apps. In December, police sent search warrants to Tinder, Reddit, Google, and Yahoo seeking Kaylee's account information. And this is interesting because as far as we know, they specifically looked at Kaylee's accounts, although it's not that surprising as Maddie had a boyfriend and Xana and Ethan were of course in a relationship. So maybe not that surprising then. They attained her dating profiles and Reddit data which was associated with two email addresses and one phone number. Uh, the two email addresses were Google and Yahoo, where they got all data from August 1st till November 13th. And police later sent more warrants to Tinder for several redacted accounts and also for an account that Maddie had at some point. And then that followed with more warrants for some more redacted accounts. And the presumption here is that the redacted accounts are them looking into people they may have have matched or messaged with on the app. Now, the latest warrants from January all seem to be about some Brian it's like the Washington State University's registrar's office, where of course Brian was attending, Brian's Google account, his Tinder profile, his Yik Yak account. Does anyone actually use Yik Yak? I don't, sorry. And finally, a Dropbox account to a person whose name is redacted as well as three email addresses. Interestingly enough, despite the gag order on all of this stuff, the Yik Yak and Tinder warrant did not have Brian's name redacted. So we do know for sure that they were, well, they got up in shit. Happy hunting, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> was that he had a sexist attitude towards females that he interacted with at the school, that he was rude to the women. Okay, take a deep breath. Now, we just have to cover the story of Brian getting fired from his TA position at Washington State University real quick. But also keep in mind that we have extremely limited sources on this and is still absolutely unconfirmed at the moment, contrary to what the internet will tell you. But supposedly, Brian was having major problems within the criminology department at Washington State University where he was in the PhD program. We now 
now are hearing that Brian was allegedly fired from his tea teaching assistant job just days before his arrest in Pennsylvania. And certain media outlets have gotten their hands on a letter from the school detailing Brian's firing and the events and dates that led up to it. So we will certainly compare that to the crime timeline and see what, if any, correlations are there. But first, I want to look at what this means for Brian's schooling had he not been arrested. According to several sources, the TA position is not necessarily a requirement for PhD students, meaning that it may not have put his degree on the line technically. However, it does have a heavy financial impact. According to the Washington State University website, assistantships are often on a competitive basis to applicants who show the most promise for excellence in graduate work and for contributing to the research or teaching programs that provide the funds for their assistantships. And what kind of funds are we talking about here? Well, it's significant. Common assistantships with a 20 hour per week obligation may pay an estimated monthly stipend of $1,949. The stipend is provided for the nine month academic year. Health insurance and most tuition costs are provided to you in addition to the stipend resulting in a total award value of up to $46,396. So we're talking tuition, boom, taken care of, paid, health insurance paid, and $2,000 a month. This is solid money for a grad student who is working part time. And Brian certainly could have been depending on that money to go to school, hence depending on, you know, that TA job in order to continue school. So let's look at what this letter from the university said. Now it's important to note that we have not been able to actually see this letter. All the news sources reporting it have not shown it. I have literally, if y'all find someone who showed it, then please do let me know because I have dug through so many resources, haven't found anyone actually show it. Like, you know, a picture of it. Uh, and it says here that it was reportedly exclusive to News Nation's Banfield. And now we are learning a few things were happening in that man's life leading up to and right after the murders. Things like being investigated by his own school, Washington State University, where he was working as a teaching assistant. And apparently the investigation wasn't going well. He was warned time after time after time to cut back on the bad behavior. Now, many, many, many news outlets, again, have reported on it, but they all hang their hat on Ashley Banfield. Now, I don't know if it's some like secret news society and that's just what you do and you trust Ashley and she's correct. I don't know, but after some I'm digging it seems like Ashley's source might be this random lady on TikTok. Like, what the hell? So it states December 19th, 2022 at the top. It states his address, Brian Koberger. I felt like it was okay to go ahead and share the address because it's all over the media involved in this case because of the arrest warrant and the, or the search warrant. So how are we to believe it exists and it's real and all of that when no one will produce the actual letter? And again, Ashley Banfield also hasn't shown the actual letter. Yes, this is me like, you know, kind of side-eyeing the situation, but still there are a lot of details that do seem to line up. So we currently believe this letter may exist. I don't know, but we do have the text of it allegedly. So it is dated December 19th. Now remember the crime was committed on November 13th in the early morning hours and Brian was arrested on December 30th. So just, just keep that in mind. So we're gonna read this together. So here we go. Mr. Koberger, I am writing this letter to formally inform you of the termination of your teaching assistantship with the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology effective December 31st, 2022. Okay, right off the bat, clear and to the point. A good topic sentence, one would expect from a university. Let's follow it up with some backing info, shall we? In keeping with the WSU Graduate Student Handbook, chapters 9G2 and 12E3, below is the list of events that led to you being deficient on the following contingency clause of your funding. Maintaining satisfactory progress in fulfilling assistance ship service requirements and duties. Oh, you know you're fucked when they already start quoting the specific section of the rules you broke. 
stroke, okay? 9G2, I'm looking at you. And, and 12E3, okay, I see you back there in the, uh, yeah, I see, we see you. Let's see what you got. So on September 23rd, 2022, you had an altercation with the faculty you support as a TA, Professor Snyder. I met with you on October 3rd to discuss norms of professional behavior. Altercation? with the professor? Oh, not Brian. What you thinking, Brian? Also, I did verify that there is in fact a Professor John Snyder in the criminology department. Just, you know, just so we're doing some fact checking on this letter that is out in the ethers, ethos, ethos, one of those. On October 21st, Professor Snyder emailed you about the ways in which you had failed to meet your expectations as a TA thus far in the semester. Okay, so he had an altercation with his professor, allegedly. Then a month later, the professor emailed you about all the ways that you failed to meet the expectations of doing your job. This is not going well, Brian. As a result, on November 2nd, graduate director Willitus and I met with you to discuss an improvement plan, which you agreed to, and I shared with you in an email dated November 3rd. This is a thorough ass letter with all the dates. And there is a graduate director, Willitus. Uh, then the head of the whole graduate program steps in. I mean, this is Brian getting sent to the principal's office, except he is in a PhD program, y'all. You can't be acting like this. But the scary thing is this is November 2nd and Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie are gone on November 13th. And the next item in this firing letter is December. So it is that meeting with the heads of the program on November 2nd that somehow allegedly could have triggered Brian into this grotesque violence. That's what people are thinking. Or did it have nothing to do with it at all? Like, what do y'all think? Was he stalking and planning this all along and these dates and events are a coincidence or maybe he was planning it and that was what was screwing up his PhD stuff? Or do you think the PhD stuff triggered something and sent him on the spree to do what he did, allegedly? It's just kind of just gross all around to think about, but... There's a month in between the, the line items of this letter and right in the middle of that month is when the crime happened. And we meet again on December 7th, this time with Professor Snyder, as well as Dr. Willits, Willits, Dr. Willits. I think I mispronounced that earlier. Dr. Willits and I to discuss your progress on the improvement plan. While not perfect, we agreed that there was progress. There was progress. So if the letter's true, he commits this heinous crime allegedly, and yet somehow he's making progress on his behavior as a TA. On December 9th, there was another altercation with Professor Snyder in which it became apparent that you had not made progress regarding professionalism and about which I wrote you on December 11th requesting a meeting. So there it is, another altercation with his professor, and now it's apparent he has not made progress. We met on December 19th when I informed you of your termination as a TA for spring semester. Boom, fired, done, gone, out, yeeted away with you, wicked witch of the West. But the one thing I am confused about, the letter says that they met and requested a meeting. But by December 19th, Brian was already in Pennsylvania. Like he and his dad drove across the country from Washington to Pennsylvania getting pulled over twice, one right after the other on December 15th. How you doing? How y'all doing today? Good, good. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. Does that mean the meeting was online, on Zoom or something? I mean, it seems pretty serious and Brian was in class with students that wasn't online and he was in class, you know, all altercating, is that a word? Alter having an altercation with Professor Snyder. So it seems like he would have been meeting with the graduate director in person, doesn't it? That's one thing about this letter that seems a, a little bit like off to me, but maybe that's just how we all kind of talk now since, you know, the C-19 and a meeting is on the phone, is on video, it's whatever. If, if you, it, words were exchanged, you had a meeting. I don't know, let me know what y'all think. 
According to the Washington State University semester calendar for fall 2022, finals started on December 12th and were over on the 16th. So the semester was certainly over by the 19th and students wouldn't be expected to be on campus or in town. And Brian obviously finished his finals if he had any or were overseeing any as a TA by the 15th when he was already driving across the country. So we're either going to have to assume Zoom or online meetings or this letter is a bunch of bullshit. Now, the other thing is that the letter never identifies who is writing the letter. It just starts with, I am writing this letter to inform you. And then whatever News Nation and Ashley Banfield trail off with, they don't include the sign off of the letters. And I'm like, well, maybe it's to protect their identity, but it's like, what's up with identifying Professor Snyder and graduate director Willits? Wouldn't it be Willits writing the letter or why didn't you protect them, but you're protecting... These are meetings mentioned that include the writer of the letter. As a result, on November 2nd, graduate director Willits and I met with you to discuss. So what the hell? Why am I just, I don't know. Let, let me know your thoughts. I just, I'm, I'm wondering like why I feel suspicious of this whole letter currently. Then according to Ashley Banfield, you know, Brian had a sexist attitude towards females that he interacted with at the school, being rude to the women and grading them differently than the men. Where was that part in the letter? Like who, I just, who told you that? I don't know where these sources are. Um, certainly we can find some backing information on Reddit, right? Nope, the Redditors are all over the place. Some are sure he was fired and sexist as a TA. Others are positive this is misinformation. And the one thing that is consistent is that I cannot find one piece of information about the sexist treatment in class as a TA. Not one tangible single piece of evidence. And all we have of this supposed firing, again, is Ashley Banfield and the random TikTok lady. Was that he had a sexist attitude towards females that he interacted with at the school, that he was rude to the women, and then get this, as a teaching assistant, he apparently graded the women differently than he graded the men. It's kind of falling apart for me and it's not typically something that I would like present to all of you except to let you know this is a major thing that was thrown around everywhere and just to let you know that it's still not like 100% verified. Maybe it will be. We will find out, uh, maybe. The kid would be covered in blood, we know that. I don't believe that the kid would have showered, do you? But yet he's asking that and you know why I think he's asking that? Because... Now let's look at another super interesting and somewhat possible theory that's been floating around and we've touched upon it before. Let's go back to that book uh, that was seized when they arrested Brian. Remember there was that one that had like underlining on page 118? Well, 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 well. Let me tell you about this wild coincidence and you tell me what y'all think, okay? Cause this one was just when I saw it, I'm like, uh, have you ever heard of Elliot Roger? Elliot Roger was a mass murderer who is unofficially credited with being the first self-identified incel. We've talked about incels a number of times, Andrew Tate, steak and potatoes, bacon, eggs, fresh and fit, all of that. Now, I'm gonna have to be censored here, but Elliot Roger was a 22-year-old American man who carried out a mass in Isla Vista, California on May 23rd, 2014, which resulted in six people losing their lives and 14 injuries. It was horrific. Uh, he became infamous for his misogynistic views in his manifesto titled My Twisted World, in which he expressed his hatred towards women for rejecting him romantically. Classic incel stuff, except for the violence isn't usually, hopefully, a byproduct. Now, although Elliot Roger was not the first self-identified incel, he is often cited as uh, one of the movement's most influential figures due to his writings and actions. But wait, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, I'm sorry, just real quick. Do you know who the first self-identifying incel was? It was a Canadian woman, a woman, who started an online group called 
Alana's Involuntary Celibacy Project in 1977. And why did she create it? The aim was to create an inclusive community embracing those whose S lives had been marginalized for reasons ranging from rigid gender norms to mental illness or social awkwardness. You mean it wasn't created by an angry group of men? Okay, oh no, wait till the incels find out their whole movement was started by a woman for very different reasons reasons. And guess what? Alana, who still likes to remain anonymous uh, beyond her first name, is pissed that men have taken over the incel name and turned it into an angry misogynist and even violent movement. But again, angry dudes do as they do. Shocking, right? Back to this book taken from Brian Koberger with something highlighted, underlined on page 118. Well, Elliot Rogers' book, My Twisted World, has a page 118 and it says this, I had nothing left to live for but revenge. Women must be punished for their crimes of rejecting such a magnificent gentleman as myself. All of these popular boys must be punished for enjoying heavenly lives and having S with all the girls while I had to suffer in lonely virginity. Is that the page 118 that Brian had underlined? And it makes me think about a post that Brian had made. Uh, we analyzed this uh, in his Reddit post back when he was like 14, 15, 16 years old, when he also talked about revenge and that being the thing that he could, was focused on. Now, we do have to remember that this is just a theory and possible a very creepy coincidence. We certainly don't know that Brian's book that was found was the My Twisted World Manifesto. And we also don't know if Brian is an incel. We just, we don't know. There's a lot of people saying that he is. We don't know for sure yet. Oh, oh, and of course, the one other thing, uh, the Facebook account that Brian may have been operating and discussing the crime with was named Papa Roger. And I don't know, you just kind of look at it and it feels like a little bit of the dink that the last names are the exact same. Elliot Roger, Papa Roger, spelled the exact same. And how many Rogers do you know with that spelling of a name? There's no S and there's a D in there not very many. So if this connection is true, then Brian wanted to hurt women and he may have felt rejected by either Maddie or Kaylee from whoever didn't respond to his DMs or for whatever reason he made up in his head. But if he identified with Elliot Rogers' manifesto, then he also wanted to be violent towards them who didn't approach him and women who loved other men and the men who were receiving love from women, men like Ethan with Xana. So if we temporarily assume that this theory is true, if Brian was following Elliot Rogers' manifesto, then it does have a horrible implication for motive for why Manny, Kaylee, Xana, and Ethan were taken. Ethan, again, was a man getting everything that Brian wanted and Brian wasn't getting. And Xana was a woman loving a man that wasn't loving him. And Maddie and Kaylee were women who also weren't giving him attention and possibly ignoring or maybe even rejecting him. There's a sad intersection here where people in general want to be loved, especially when I remember the history of Brian when he was just a child himself, an early teenager dealing with the visual snow and the, the depression and the anxieties and all of those things that just didn't seem like he was getting help for. Things like this can really escalate. And when they are not, when they're not loved, they want to place blame sometimes. Uh, they want to place blame somewhere or anywhere. And I'm going to say, say it, Brian being a man in this society, not getting, you know, the love and adulation that he thinks is his birthright, potentially, uh, from those he's essentially attracted to, uh, you know, that he has somehow been systemically taught that he deserves something that he's not getting, and he doesn't understand why. And again, this is all under the very broad umbrella that Brian may have identified as incel, which we honestly don't know right now. We don't. We could throw the labels out there. I get it. Totally get it. We don't know yet. Hopefully we will in June um, if something comes out of this preliminary hearing. 
by his own school, Washington State University, where he was working as a teaching assistant. We're told behavioral problems specifically. So that catches us up on some of the most compelling updates from this case. There is constantly new information coming out, so I will continue to gather and research it so that I can present it as best as possible. And certainly when this gag order is lifted, there is going to be so much more to come out and hopefully we'll put a lot of the missing pieces together for everyone. Now, please excuse the tone shift for a moment because I need to say a couple of things at the end of all of my docs, but thank you again for continuing to watch and share and support these. I'm just so grateful for this community we've built and for our Petty University community. You all are the absolute best. Be sure to check out Helix Sleep linked below and take their sleep quiz and get the mattress of your dreams with their 100 night sleep trial and finally get the restful sleep you deserve, honey. And again, I'm so grateful to even have sponsors and thank you for checking them out week after week. Your support of the docs and for supporting the sponsors is what makes these donations even possible and I will be donating a portion of the proceeds to Hope for Justice. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram linked below. That's where I post every day and give you updates on the cases that we cover here. A couple of Twitter shout outs for my last doc which was the eight passengers downfall. Holy sh is that family a whole mess? If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you grab a snack and watch it. It is wild. First shout out goes to Stephanie who says, if anyone hasn't watched one of Swoop's docs, you are truly missing out. She brings education and light to topics that need to be discussed. She doesn't spill tea. I mean, the petty is real, but necessary. Uh, but she discusses facts. You can tell she cares about the victims. Uh, thank you so much for the kind words. And second shout out goes to Michelle who says, I've always felt icky about the idea of family channels. This video confirmed everything I feared. These poor children. It hurts my heart that parents are exploiting their kids for money. Absolutely disgusting. Very well done video. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it and thank you again uh, for following along with me on Twitter and Instagram and keeping the conversation going. I want to once again send my deepest condolences to the victims, families, and friends, and the survivors. As always, I hope that we can all keep Maddie, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan in our hearts and minds and continue to show support to their families as this case moves on potentially to a trial where they may have to relive their loss in ways that are just so unfair. While it's always innocent until proven otherwise, if Brian is the guilty culprit, which a lot of evidence suggests, I hope legal justice is swift and their families are left with no doubt in their minds that the monster who took their children is locked away for good. And with that, I hope they're able to find even a shred of healing from a situation that will never have closure because their loved ones will not be coming back in this life. But I do hope in time that their memories will always be a blessing. And as with all of the other docs on this case, I'll finish this with some words from those who knew and loved Kaylee, Zana, Maddie, and Ethan the best. I think of the times I got to spend alone with you and the memories we made together and how truly special I felt to be your friend. You did a really good job of making everyone that was close to you feel significant and loved. Not many people get lucky enough to have a friend like you, Zana. The world is a darker place without them, but the light of their, the light of their love and memories will always guide us all. We love you, Maddie, Kaylee, Santa, and Ethan. Kaylee, you will never be forgotten. We will live by for you every day with your mentality in our mind. We love you so much. You always had all of the mom's phone numbers because they all just loved you so much, even after only meeting you for a short time. There really wasn't one person that didn't love you and your amazing personality. I love you so much and miss you like crazy. Take care of each other and I'll see you very soon with a new doc. Swoop!